So, one, two, three. And please stand with us as we sing. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. up with some announcements. Good morning. Welcome to Manny Baptist Church. Is this on? <laughs> Hello. There we go. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you're just arriving or even if you've been here for a few minutes, uh, look around and make eye contact with someone you haven't seen yet this morning. Wave at them. Say good morning in lieu of handshakes. We're doing this. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. I'd like to draw your attention to some things in the bulletin, the first of which is this lavender-colored insert. We're having a church hike on March the 20th. That's going to be uh, out at Shore Acres. There's going to be two hikes. One's going to start at one end and go a little bit more difficult, end up at the viewing area at Shore Acres. The other one is going to start at the Lighthouse Viewing Station, Simpson Reef area 
and hike inwards along the bluff. That one's a little less difficult. John Owens is orchestrating this. So if you've got questions, concerns, um, everything you need to know is on that sheet, uh, the two hikes. It's uh, bring a bag lunch and your own uh, something to drink. We're going to be leaving from the church at 9.30 that Saturday morning on the 20th. Um, and you know what church departure times are like. So 9.30-ish. <clears throat> and feel free to show up. Dress uh, weather appropriate, I would encourage. We don't know what it's going to be like on that day yet. But rain or shine, we will be hitting the trails out at Shore Acres. That's a great church event, opportunity to rub shoulders with each other uh, and get a little bit of exercise. Hopefully, it'll be a day like today and be beautiful out there. Of course, it'll be windy. Thanks, Bob. It's going to be windy. Way to put a cloud on the silver lining. Um, next Sunday, youth group is going to be from 630 to 8 here at Emmanuel. Um, there is going to be a graveside service for Frank Capehart on the 13th, which is this coming Saturday at 2.30 at Myrtle Creek Cemetery on Rink Creek Lo Road. If you aren't familiar with that, you turn onto Rink Creek and it's almost an immediate left turn for the cemetery there. And last but certainly not least, we are having an all church cleanup work day on the 27th of March, right at the end of the month, from nine to three. And uh, Kelly's got a little bit more about that after we pray. Okay, right now. Okay. Um, on that work day 27th, one of the things that there's been a lot of interest being generated in different directions in terms of taking care of our facility and, and just doing things. And so um, anywhere from, you know, just cleaning to decorating to remodeling in a number of things. And so we need to know the deacons are basically the main contact point for this. Um, that's Bob and, and, and Sonny and Brian. And uh, we also just want to know whoever else is interested. You have creative ideas, you have, you know, working uh, skills um, and all of that to, to begin to coalesce around this. Because I know like putting together meetings with, you know, a diverse group of people with different schedules is not always easy to do, but we've got to get together and think it through together. One example is, you know, there was a thought about putting baseboard upstairs. Well, yeah, that's, that, that needs to be done. Um, and replaced, but if we're going to paint, paint first. You know, just a lot of times just simple order of things as well. So be thinking about that. Approach one of the deacons or myself um, and anticipate uh, attempting to recruit you, okay? All right, so Sonny was going to come up and pray. Thank you. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can be in your house to worship and praise your name. You are the great I am, and, and we worship you, Lord, and come to bring our praises to you, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to what you have uh, the pastor to bring to us today, Lord, that we may be receptive uh, to your words, Lord, and that we apply them to our lives. Be with the uh, time of remembrance today as, a, as we celebrate uh, the risen Savior, Lord. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless the offerings that are brought today, that they may be used to fulfill your message in this community and around the world. We ask these in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. All righty, so let's uh, stand together and sing some more praises. Sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord. Every word, may my life reflect. 
reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. Won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord.
enslaved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. Did that grace appear the hour I first believed? My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. You are stronger, you 
Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to go right into a time of celebrating communion, a time of remembrance of the Lord. If, if you do not have yours, there are a couple of places, baskets out in the other room, and, and there's one right here as well. Um, let's just take a few more moments just in silence and in prayer, and, and uh, as we consider uh, our Lord. Father in heaven, Lord, as we uh, just come to your table, as you invite us to come and celebrate Passover with you, to celebrate this portion of that Passover meal with you, um, that you gave all important, huge meaning to, of the, the bread and the the afikoma, that which comes later, and the, the third cup to be now symbolize your body broken, your blood shed for us. Uh, so we come with gratitude. Uh, we certainly should come with uh, humility, maximized humility. in the presence of the one uh, who is with our sacrifice in our place on our behalf and not because you really wanted to but because you chose to because uh, you loved us that much. Help us Lord God to as we do this in remembrance of you, to remember, uh, <clears throat> to remember what you had done then that became applied to real in our lives at that point when we exercised saving faith in you. 
as well as what you have done even before then that we now can recognize as well as what you've done since then, what you've done in our lives. The evidence of your presence. You know, as I, as I stand here in this quiet building, a thought I was having is that <clears throat> the Passover would be a celebration. So it would have been really, even with just, you know, 13 of them gathered together in that room, it would have been a, a kind of, you know, loud and celebratory um, for a time. Because then, as it became more and more obvious, it became more and more, not obvious, it really never became fully obvious to them, but it became more clear the realities of what Jesus, you know, was sharing with them. It would have become ultimately incredibly somber and quiet. Um, and then even the mention of the one who was going to betray him, and then a little bit of a stir, and then a, a sense of um, and him continuing to remind them of when he had shared with them foreshadows of the fact that he was going to give his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for them and and uh, and so for us I think it, it's for me anyway it's often kind of the opposite of that I generally come to communion with a sense of somberness and I think, you know, that remorse, that, that, you know, grief for our sin that, was requ that required his atonement on the cross. And then I, I, I kind of leave the room with celebration in that knowing that he, he's done this and it's complete and it's for us. And then he says, do this again as often as you will until I come again. And so that ends with that triumphant hope of that I'm coming back. I will raise from the dead for one thing. That's not the end at all. And even then as I go for a time and send my Holy Spirit to be with you. And then when I return, I will come for my bride just as I have promised. And so it ends with that great transcendent hope of his return and just the, the fullness of the fact that uh, yes, he did this and yes, it was because of me but it was because of his love for me he lifts my head because he says I'm his and he's coming back for me. So he shared with those early friends of his, his closest and he gathered them together and they shared the Passover meal together and probably about two hours into that um, they would have come to the, the resurrected bread. And um, he took that piece of, the, the, of special piece of matzah in the Passover meal. He took it and he would have broken it and probably literally would have taken the full, the, 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 what's now, it's actually a por partial of the whole, is the afkomen. Uh, more on that on Passover. Um, and they likely would have, you know, shared taken some and then handed to his left and to his right. Don't know for sure. Sure would make sense. And uh, he shared it with them and he said, now this, this is, uh, represents my body, my body broken for you. And remembering that again, be willingly and lovingly, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then at a time probably, oh, it's usually about 20 minutes or so in a Passover meal between the Afikoman and the third cup, the cup of redemption. And uh, he took the cup <coughs> uh, and said, this now represents uh, my blood shed for you freely. And uh, do this in remembrance of me.
Father, again, we thank you for something that's so amazing to remember. Um, really the only thing you've given us to do, to do over and over and over again. Um, because of how central it is to saving faith and that we need to be reminded. I know I need to be reminded of the cost really the the, the value the, re, the, the redemption value of my sin and that we can remember we can remember all the great and wonderful things you've done and we can remember that it is you who said do this till I come again so we can remember and be reminded that you're coming back and, and you have it all together left us. You've sent your Holy Spirit, who is you, as to be with us as a helper, close, intimate with each one. Thank you, Lord. So we thank you. We praise you as we remember you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ah. To be reminded and... Uh, I'm considering right now that really in a sense these letters we're looking at in the book of Revelation are reminders. They would have been when they were first written and went to those seven cities, towns and cities, they would have been right there right now for you. This is happening in your midst right now. And this is what I, Jesus, the Lord of the church, say to you. And then for every subsequent generation, they stand for us as a reminder and a warning. Where any one of these things could be true of any given church or even individual at any time in history. And it's actually quite highly concerning to consider that any of these of the rebukes in five of the seven letters may be true of you or me and of this local church as a whole but it must be considered for likely to some degree they all are present with us the the corrections that he gives uh, so we can turn to chapter 2 of Revelation right now and take a look. <clears throat> we are actually in chapter 3, verse 1, but just quickly before that, two thoughts from last week on Thyatira. Um, one of the principles that we derived out of that was that, was this. What may be acceptable to our society around us is often abhorrent to Christ. They were doing all kinds of things that they thought were okay and acceptable, and he says, no. We have a culture and society all around us that have all kinds of things they consider acceptable that God does not, and therefore... You know, we, we really all together entirely shouldn't. Though sometimes and too often we do and we participate or we just kind of go too much with the flow because it's hard to swim upstream. And then notice in verse 21 of chapter 22, or chapter 2, Verse 21, I gave her time to repent. In this case, it's but she didn't want to. The point there is, is that I often say that before God brings any judgment or discipline 
Judgment upon the world or discipline upon the church, it is always preceded with the opportunity to repent. It's never like, oh gosh, you know, you didn't give me fair warning, Lord. Oh, you know, you didn't warn me. You didn't let me know. You didn't write it in the sky somehow. No. He, he has actually written it in the sky and everywhere else. And uh, he is given opportunity to repent. So as we continue on in these early chapters of Revelation where before he gets into all the future telling, he's talking, he talks first about the now. Chapters 2 and 3 are the now. And on our map you see out in the ocean that where he's writing from, exiled on the island of Patmos because of his faithfulness to Christ. Then he went across onto the shore at Ephesus, north through Smyrna, Pergamum, down through Thyatira, and now on his way toward Laodicea um, is Sardis. Let's read this section together. Father in heaven, as we look into your word, I pray that you would open our eyes and ears and that we would hear what your spirit has to say to the church. The message to Sardis, chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> to the messenger of the church in Sardis, write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard. And keep it. And repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the first part of verse 1, the destination, Sardis. Sardis was an important commercial city. Not all these words. Remember last we saw there, there have been, you know, Thyatira was a small town, small church. Here once again he's come to the city, about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, Sardis. It was a center for pagan worship and particularly a temple of Artemis. Here is a picture of the ruins of the temple of Artemis. Many of them completely wiped from the face of the earth. Several still remaining. The temple were all manner of things you know, again, not consistent with God's culture and plan for society took place. It's only a small village today. It's called Sart. Um, small village. This is all in, in uh, uh, this is western Turkey. And uh, not much there. It's a small town. It remains to this day among the ruins. And then this, the next part of, of verse 1. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. And remember we talked about how the seven spirits of God, the, spirit, the very spirit of God, the seven stars are the churches themselves. He says, I've got it. I am the one who has it. He says... I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. So if we stop right there, it can start to sound a little bit like a commendation. This is, because he always starts with, with, with something good that he can say. And then he comes and says, but, however, I have this 
against you and he tells them lovingly how, what they need to correct in their lives and the lives of their church. But here to the church in Sardis, there really is no commendation. This is really one of the sickest and most unhealthy of the churches that he addresses. They haven't got much going right. And as much as you might want to try and extract, you know, a point to the commendation, it's, it's, it would maybe seem to be here, but it isn't. Because in the same breath, it is part of the beginning of the rebuke. It says... I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So this word of approval turns out actually to be a word of rebuke as he declares to them that you have a reputation of being alive. Not only does it look like it, but you actually have a reputation, a name, right? That's, that's, that's how you're viewed in the community. Oh my, you know, yeah. They're an effective church. Their contemporaries would have thought. But yikes. He, stripped, he quickly strips away their reputation by declaring that they are dead. And like the Pharisees, it really it just, just boom, man, my mind went straight to where Jesus says in Matthew 22, Excuse me, Matthew 23, beginning of verse 27. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. God sees through the facade. He sees the true you and me and the true corporate us as the church. Like the Pharisees, man, their outward appearance was nothing more than a facade that was hiding a lack of life, a lack of genuine life. And really, you could say they were the walking dead. They were spiritual zombies. Sardis was a zombie church. And then he goes on in verse 2 and continues. He says, wake up. Which is a part of the, you know, repent. Wake up from the delusions you have. That what's on the surface is somehow adequate. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, the little bit that's left, wake up and strengthen what remains. And sometimes in a Christian's life, think about this, not only to prominent leaders, but anyone who proclaims faith in Christ. Sometimes you see them and you go, man, they are on fire. It's a term we often use, they're on fire for God. And then sometime later, usually some indeed some time, years perhaps, you, 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 you read an article if they're famous enough, or you hear about this friend of yours, or whatever, and you go, what? Seemingly impossible. And yet it is. And usually that is not an overnight thing. This, there's a deep, long downhill slide to when crash, it all comes apart. And the little that remains is somewhere, man, you are going down that slope. And there's either a cliff at the end or there's just a sudden hard stop at the end. And you're just about there. God says... Wake up, strengthen the little that remains, come back to me, get it together, man. Don't be a fool. Turn while there is still time, that opportunity to repent. 
Remember what you have received and heard. Let me back up, sorry. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. It, they're close. Maybe you are close. But your crashing and burning that the whole world knows does not have to happen. You can wake up right now and put an end to that. And to God's grace, perhaps no one ever know from what depths you had fallen and from what depths you have risen because of God in your life and only because we turn to him and he's the doer of it all. You can't do it on your own. All we do is just wake up and say, yes, Lord, you're right. Help me. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. They had lived up to his calling in their life. And, and I think that's true in all too many of us. Man, God's got calling. You know, a lot of times people think, you know, people in what we call vocational Christian ministry have a calling. Every Christian, every born-again person that God puts his spirit inside of you, he has a calling on your life to do and to live and to breathe and to act for him and his specific purposes for you. And it can be incredibly unique and diverse and different as we are, but he has a calling in your life. And oftentimes I think we just kind of sit on it because God doesn't force things. We are not some sort of, you know, automated robot that he comes inside of and makes, you know, and animates us and makes us move around and do what we do involuntary to our own will. No. So though he has a calling on your life, man, we can refuse it. We can refuse to be obedient. We can refuse to be faithful. He says, man, you have not done it yet. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So then he says in verse 3, so remember. And we talked about remembering today already. Remembrance is a powerful thing. When you read the Psalms, sometimes David starts in the pit. He is so hurting, body, soul, and spirit. He's got little left. And he is crying out in anguish and anger toward God. In frustration with his life and and then he begins to remember who God really is and his work in his life. And he begins to rebound. And by the end of the psalm, there's David praising God again. Remember is the hinge point. So remember the gospel in your life. Remember the day of salvation in your life. Remember God's grace in your life. Remember all the things he's done. Remember what you have received and heard. Now here, particularly speaking of the truth of Scripture, I believe. That which you have received and you have heard. The truth, regardless of all the lies around you in Sardis, the temple and all the things. Remember what you have received and heard. And so remember, obey, and repent, verse 3. Remember what you've seen and heard. Do it and repent. Remember, obey, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. It's the exhortation. And here I think we could, we, the exhortation's a bit broken up. It would be, first of all, Chapter 3, the first part of verse 2. Wake up and strengthen what remains. And then verse 3, remember what you received and heard. Do it and repent. Remember, obey, repent. And therefore, if you do not, the exhortation includes that warning. It is conditional. Much of the Christian life is conditional. The gospel is unconditional. The only condition is that you know, we say yes 
to the gospel that Jesus is God, he died in my place because I deserved it, he rose again from the dead and gives eternal life. But much of the Christian life is conditional, particularly how, how we experience life from day to day, whether it goes well or doesn't go well in, in so many of those, those areas in our life. So, if you do not wake up, his exhortation from verse 2, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. The thief is that thing where you don't know when. It just, boom, happens. It comes out of nowhere, and suddenly, and there it is. Uh, unexpected. And... If not soon, certainly sudden when it does happen. We don't want that. I don't want that in my life. I don't want it in your life. I'm sure you don't want it in your own life. But we must remember, obey, and repent. Or, because God loves you way too much to let you go farther and farther and farther away. Even when we see those ones that didn't strengthen a little bit was remained and crashed at the end. He was attempting to get their attention all the way through. And oftentimes he would. Oh gosh, I know, Lord, that this is not what I should be doing. But, but, oh. And then. And, and God says, I will not be mocked. Do not be deceived. I will not be mocked, Almighty God says. One of the things I believe that means, is, particularly in this context, is, is that we can, we can go about our life in a certain way and for a period of time not experience much of any consequence. Oftentimes there's a lag and delay before the consequence comes. Sometimes I think we could, we could be really doing great and all kinds of good consequences are happening blessings all around me from Almighty God and they're still trickling in as I begin to steer away from him and do my own thing and then I kind of think well gosh it didn't really nothing really seemed to change not overnight I'm still kind of getting the grace of yesterday's glory and but it'll catch up with me eventually and the natural consequences come his discipline comes um, and just as we've often said all of it unnecessary but in contingent upon our our faithfulness right our belief our, our response to the discipline just as I've always told my children I was very very clear with my kids when it came to discipline they, they knew the game plan so they were never without excuse and so or never with excuse and so I would, it was, the discipline stops when the behavior changes. When the negative behavior for which you're being disciplined, when you, when you, you know, wake up from that foolishness and do the right thing, then I have no need. So your discipline in your own life is virtually in your own hand. Because my hand is already determined. It will respond when it's necessary, when the wrong has been done. So for us, before Almighty God, same thing. If we're in the midst of his discipline right now, that's different than pruning, because pruning hurts, but pruning is just God working on us to refine us. Discipline hurts because of, you know, the stupid things we're doing. And quite distinct, and we should be able to recognize, and we say, oh Lord, you're right, and what a fool I am, and, and help me to... To discontinue that improper behavior and do the right thing. <clears throat> Less I come like a thief at a time and hour you do not know. But then we come as we have in each one of these, fifthly to the promise. God is so good, so gracious. Remember as we were going through the book of Isaiah, oftentimes we would have this horrible, ugly look at the rebellion of mankind. 
And then we'd see the necessary following judgment of God. And then we would see him come back with the promises of kingdom hope and kingdom future. That's how it was, for, it was in the book of Isaiah. And here, same. It, it, it's really as if Almighty God has such an abundance of grace and mercy and promise that it always finds its way, uh, if not at the very end. Verse 4, but, I have, but you have a few people in Sardis <clears throat> who have not soiled their garments. Um, a, a graphic illustration there, picture, isn't it? Uh, you have people who have not soiled their garments. And I don't know about you, but you know, my, my mind leaps to how we might you know, physically defile and, and, and soil our garments. But clearly here he's speaking of the, the soiling our garments with our own sin, our own rebellion, our own that he's already been been speaking of. And that becomes even more clear because in the next verse he speaks of the white garments that, he's, that he gives. Those are not physical garments. Those are the, the, the very representation of the righteousness of Christ with which I am clothed. But I get ahead of myself. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Worthy? Interesting, I thought the gospel was without worth, without, with, with uh, great worth, but, but not merit-based. It's not something that I can become worthy of the gospel of salvation. You are correct. But so much of the rest of, of Christian life does come down to a point. Because it isn't, again, just like we're all, we've not all chosen the same things. We have not all chosen and willed to be as faithless or faithful as another. And if I am in that place, at a key point in time, then it is like, Kelly, you've been blowing it for too long right now, and you are not worthy of this. Yes, you are worthy of my blood, and you are born again, and you will be with me forever, and so it's really going to be okay, but you are not worthy of this. And then there will be those who are worthy. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. God rewards faithfulness. He rewards obedience. And he indeed disciplines unfaithfulness and disobedience. That should be obvious. If, if you know him and you've walked with him for any time, you know that. You know when you've gotten attaboys from daddy and when you've gotten the belt from dad. In our relationship with Almighty God, it should be evident. Because he actually tells the writer of Hebrews, says that if you don't receive the discipline of God, then you are not an actual child of God. Because he is faithful to discipline his children. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who, who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. Rather, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The promise. See, the, whole, the church as a whole was, was dead or dying. And by dead meaning, even if they're, they're born again, they're Christians, they're, they, were, they were brought to almost a zero in terms of effective witness and testimony to him. So the church as a whole was dead or dying. Yet Jesus recognizes a remnant in the Sardis church that had not soiled the garments with sin. And he gives this promise to be dressed in white, the symbolic righteousness of Christ himself. The names will be written in the book of life. And he will acknowledge them before his father and his angels. Hallelujah. 
Now, this, this statement that their names will not be erased from the book of life presents a problem for some. But a person who is truly born again remains regenerate, remains born again, as it, John, same author, has written elsewhere. And I'll cite just a couple of those passages. In John chapter 6, 35 to 37, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I'm really thirsty right now. So again, what's he talking about? We'll never thirst of water? No way. We'll never thirst of the water of his spirit in our spiritual life, right? He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have, you have seen me and yet do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. In verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. But raise it up on the last day. And in chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I did a whole series of teachings a couple of years ago on the perseverance of the saints, of eternal security of the one who has saving faith in Jesus Christ. And though it may seem to some to imply that a name could be erased, I think it's actually, it, it, it only gives a, the positive affirmation that their names will not be erased. And incredibly, think of it in these terms, incredibly though the text says just the opposite. Some take this verse to teach that a believer's name can be erased from the book of life. They turn a promise into a threat. They take the very promise of Almighty God and it becomes somehow a threat. And I think it has to do maybe with something like this. That in John's day, because remember when scripture was written, it was written in the everyday understandable language and context, the, the analogies and stories and various things that they, they, they would have understood in their daily normal life. The only reason sometimes it seems more foreign today to some as we read them is because our, our culture is so far removed. Different geographical location with its culture is a great difference in time, even language and all these things. In John's day, they were, the rulers kept a register of, of citizenry. It had to be done more on a more local basis because they didn't have all the communications we have and travel that we have today. So... Within even a city, they would keep a register of the citizens of the city. If someone died or committed a serious crime, their name was erased from that register. Jesus, the King of Heaven, is really promising to never erase the true Christian's name from the role of those names. As he says in chapter 13 of Revelation, those which were written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So on the contrary, he goes on, you know, Christ will confess every believer's name before God the Father and before his angels. Is that not what it says in in verse 5, he who overcomes will be clothed with white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before God my Father and before his angels. So it's a proactive statement that this will not happen and this will happen. Indeed, they will not be erased. They will be proclaimed before all those in the heavenlies <clears throat> and also we can see this as a reaffirmation of the promise 
that Jesus himself made during his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, he says to them, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. If you are one of his, he is going to have no problem claiming you. He's going to say, this is one of my kids. You know? This is Susie, and she's mine. You know, this is Billy here, and he's mine. And I'm proud of that fact. Almighty God, what he has done for us, he did to, the, to where he is, in a sense, that proud, doting father who, who really, in Ephesians, he talks about as if he raises us as a trophy of his before all the scoffers and mockers in the heavenly places. We are his, and he has made this promise from long ago. So, I am going to reference to you, I believe on your notes there is an extensive passage in Romans chapter 8. Actually, what you, what you might want to do is sometime this week, today or this week, is read not only that portion, but Romans 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> Those three chapters in the book of Romans. Uh, to see this as clearly as it is presented anywhere in Scripture. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. And then particularly noting this section of 8, uh, Romans 8, verses 28 through 39. So these spiritually zed zombies who were playing church needed to heed Christ's warning of impending judgment. These indifferent believers needed to wake up before indeed it was too late. The faithful few and even all who would hear what the Spirit says to the churches could take comfort in the knowledge that their salvation was eternally secure. And then this letter, just like all the other six, ends or toward the end, says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, verse 6. The, this letter to Sardis it's a searching message today to churches that are full of activity and housed in beautiful buildings but have little or no evidences of actual genuine life, eternal life. And Christ's word to them would be today, remember, obey, and repent. Remember, Obey and repent. Verse 3. Remember what you've received and heard. Do it, keep it, or obey and repent. Just as it was for them, so it is for anyone for whom the shoe fits. In today's Many, many churches in the world. And it is worthy of our time and effort to examine ourselves. To what extent is this true? Yes, also in my personal life, with the letters addressed to the corporate life of the body of Christ, the church, of which we all are members and we make up one living organism, the church. It's pretty easy, apparently, to pull it off. Because not only were they just looking okay on the outside, but it was dead on the inside. They did it to the extent that they had a reputation that they were alive. Okay. So what about you, what about me, what about us? 
and to what extent perhaps. So on the other side of uh, your outline are today's, and I failed to bring that up with me today, but those are just for you and I to, you know, introspectively take an assessment of ourselves and ask ourselves these questions. And rarely, I think, are we completely not somewhere in that discussion. So please do not just dismiss them and move on or think, well, no, I, mean, I don't think I'm one of those. Well, you not, might want to be one of those, you know, just iconically or, or you know, just clearly identify as such. But to what extent are these same things happening and to whatever extent in my life and in the life of our local church? And to whatever degree it is to remember, obey, and repent, I put, take you back once again to verse 3. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord God, I, uh, I thank you that... Um, uh, it can even be hard to thank you for all of the, the things that you remind us of and point out in our lives, but I thank you, Father, that you do because you, 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 you want so much more for us and from us. You want so much more than the passive obedience we bring, but to bring active obedience And Lord, that we would look at ourselves and honestly and deeply and then that would be a very, very positive exercise if we then acknowledge those things and remember and obey and repent. Help us, Lord God, to whatever degree we are asleep to wake up. For those who are all together asleep to wake up. And strengthen that which remains. And indeed before it's too late. There's always a point which it becomes too late. And Father, may we indeed have an ear to hear and let us hear what you say to the churches and to the church, to me. And help me, Father, indeed, more than just a sheer exercise, but to, in some real life-altering way, remember and repent. Uh, and obey. And I ask all this in Jesus' name and even for his sake and for the sake of the kingdom and the lost. Amen. God bless. Thanks. All right. Please stand with us for the closing hymn. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace. 
to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge beneath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Came on.